Okay, so I think we're going to get started in a minute or two. I would love it if anybody, everybody who can will turn their videos on because it's really depressing to lecture to uh, screens that are just down. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's have some more people. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. I am also guessing some people are possibly still AFK. But in about a minute or two, I'm going to start anyway. How are you doing? I'm doing good, good. Uh, overall good, Can, all Great. things considered. Uh, so I think we will get started. Uh, get started with the people who are here. If anybody wants to join in later, then they'll have to make sense of what's happening. Uh, so this is, not going to be, as I sort of commented, a, way, uh, a lecture on how to do a PM speech. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing most of you or all of you know how to do a PM speech. That is, find three points, analyze them to some presentable level, and then give those three points in a speech. Uh, that, that, that's cool, but I think uh, most people know how to do that. This is going to be about how to do a PM speech in the in what I think is the way that I found found is best for me, the way that that I think is the most fun way, the way that I think is the most exciting way, and I think more importantly, it's about helping everyone here see the beautiful side and the fun side and the good side of the doing the speech that so many people like fear and despise. Uh, so, so the story I, I usually start this talk with is that. At some point, every like team, every pair of debaters uh, gets to their coach or whoever did the trials for their society or uh, an experienced debater from their society with the horrible dilemma where you have the two people coming and they say, which of the two of us do you think is more suited to do PM? And everybody's like praying that, that you say, that the, they say that the other person is is the one that that should do PM, you know, because I'm 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 I think I'm very responsive. I think and 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 Tom and I were in exactly that situation in 2016. We both came to our coach at the time, Sela, and we asked him who's going to be PM, and we both wanted to be second speaker, uh, because I thought about PM then. What I think a lot of you think about it. Uh, we will try to uh, workshop a little bit of examples together. We'll try to talk a lot about examples that I remember. This will involve me talking a lot about myself, which is kind of vain, but it's going to happen for two reasons. One is that I just remember things about myself much better than I remember things about other people. Slightly narcissistic, but I guess fine. I also brought some videos by other people so we can take a look at them. And also, since I'm talking about the way that I think PMs should be done, then about like 80% of my speeches fall into that category, whereas with other people's speeches, it sort of depends. Uh, this lecture will only talk to first speakers. I will discuss LO, but I won't discuss uh, DPM DLO. Uh, for second speakers, uh, you guys won when you had the argument, uh, so we won't be hearing any complaints uh, from you because you got to be second speakers, and that's probably what you wanted. Uh, so. I think I think what this lecture is about is about doing PM in a way that's beautiful, in a way that's memorable. It's not necessarily going to be the easiest way to do a solid PM, to do a PM that's passable. I think the and and by the way, whenever you try to change something in debating or in tennis or in whatever you're doing, the process that you encounter is always this. Like there is always a dip when you try to 
consciously leave old habits behind and leave things that you're comfortable doing behind. Uh, but I think it's more fun. I think it's more worthy. And I think it, it's actually more competitive in the higher levels. Uh, so I think PM starts with prep time, right? Because it is by far and away the hardest speech to prepare to because you really only have 15 minutes. If this is a regional competition, you're walking two or three of them. If this is worlds or euros, you're walking probably five or seven of them. So, so not a lot of time sitting down at all. And then you have to sit down and, and, and do a speech. And, and that's why I think talking about PM starts from talking about prep. We will talk about the speech, but I think that's where we start from. So the first thing about how to do what I think is a good PM is about how you approach preparation. And, and, and here it's, it's a philosophy or a trick or a way that I've learned from uh, uh, a talk Will Jones gave at uh, the Red Sea Open, God rest its soul, a few, year, a few years ago. Uh, if, if you don't know Will, uh, you can Google him. He's a very impressive speaker, uh, uh, which is try to think of why the CAs gave that motion. So this is, by the way, sometimes hard to do in practice because in practice, when you get a motion, it's not always time set to the present. It's not always like as crafted as a motion that you would get in a competition. But when you're in a competition, a team of pretty talented CAs has specifically chosen this motion. And so you can get a lot by asking yourself like the opposite question, which is why the CAs gave this motion? What is it really about? Why are we debating this and not anything else? Why are we incentivizing this thing specifically? Why are we doing, why are we criminalizing this thing specifically? And I think that's the first way of, of how, to, how to find that, that logic. And the reason I'm talking about that logic is I think people often confuse finding points with finding a case. So points are, are, are sometimes not that hard to find. You just, we'll talk about how to find them later, right? But you just think about what gets better, what gets worse, what gets impacted. But I think the problem that people have is that what they sort of gobble together by the end of prep is this mishmash miscellaneous points and not a case that is actually a full worldview, a full perception. And I think if you look at the issues that you really hold opinions about in real life, what you have is not five points with five reasons for each of them. What you have is an actual like put together perception that's consistent with itself and internally prioritized. That's what we want. So we'll talk, so, so, so what, what is a case then? I like to think of a case like as a strategical plan rather than a tactical plan. So if we take like a military analogy, I'm sorry to take a military analogy, kind of boring, but 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 if we take like a military analogy, the tactics are how do you take this hill, how do you take this valley, how do you take this place? But the the strategy is how you how you take the entire war, how you take the entire battle. So I I, I think it I think it's about how do you build uh English, an array of things that together make up a whole story, a whole worldview. And I think sort of one of the ways to find, like to recognize when you found this case is I think oftentimes in prep, there is this like wow moment, this like moment, this watershed moment where you're like, oh, I now get this motion. I now get why they've done this. I now get why, uh, they why they're even talking about letting uh, an example I saw yesterday diaspora Jews vote in elections to the Knesset. Like why are they even thinking about this odd idea? Why are there are they talking about letting uh, a minority communities impeach the the chief of police? And sometimes those are accessible and easier, and sometimes those are quite hard. But the moment in which you get them is a moment in which case constructions starts to flow more easily. So what does a case include? The first thing it naturally includes is points. And I think here we'll talk about something that sounds really basic, but actually isn't because so many people get it wrong. What is a point and how do you find it? A point is something that in and of itself, by itself, proves a bottom line. That is, it proves a burden to the debate, a burden to winning the debate. That's important because Oftentimes we talk about characterizations, we talk about how people will respond to a certain message but don't really do anything with that. It's really important that we ourselves recognize that anything that we can't do 
the tieback for, anything that we can't do connect to the motion, that is not really a point. That is something on the way to a point. And when we roadmap it like a point, we confuse ourselves because we're like, okay, we got this one. And we confuse our adjudicators because they've just heard a bunch of stuff that ends with a conclusion that is off clash. So that won't necessarily uh, make them persuaded. So, so I think it's important to tell apart what your points are. And your points are should at the very least be something that if you accept all of them, you are now persuaded of the motion. And, and, and this seems like a trivial point, but I can't tell you how many times I've seen a prime minister speech where at the end of prime minister, if there are no more speeches and I have to call the debate, I don't have a call yet because they've given me like things but haven't necessarily met all their burdens, haven't necessarily explained why the motion, uh, why the motion is. So for the classic policy, it's there's a problem, it's solved and the, the solution is justifiable, right? Uh, why, why it's a whole thing. And, 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 and the way to find those points, we may get to that later, but it's to have a state of mind that isn't about opposition. It's about what's a persuasive case for this motion? How do I persuade someone of this motion? It's not about this motion sucks. It's not about I'm unhappy about the position that we drew. It's not about I have this silver bullet that I'm thinking of for opposition and it may destroy us because that's how you don't find a case. Uh, it's about, it's about a state of mind of, let me try and visualize the world in, in, in a world with this motion, ask myself both the rationale for doing this thing and how the world looks under this thing. I'm gonna talk, I'm talking right now more about policy because I think policy is where debating starts from. It's, it's the most um, clear type of motion. It's the most, uh, I, I think it's the basic skill. There's a reason it's taught to freshers before the other kinds. And then we'll talk about the other kinds a little bit later. What does the case include other than points though? This is by the way, a good time that, to say that if you joined, I would love it if you would turn your videos on because it's more fun for me, but you know, can't force you. Uh, so what what is a case other than 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 that? So it what what does it entail other than that? So first of all, a mechanism, trivially. I think uh, on average, people care too much about mechanisms. We're gonna talk about mechanisms later, uh, but, but I think people care too much about mechanisms, but mechanisms are a part of it. A stance, the difference between a stance and a mechanism, a stance is about knowing how you feel about tangential or adjacent questions to the question of the debate. So how do you feel, uh, um, about the sort of things like people would ask a POI about, about the, the so if you wanna, if the, if the motion is this house would break up Amazon, your stance has to tell you, us, how do you feel about breaking up Google and Facebook, like the other tech giants or Microsoft, right, whatever. Uh, but also how do you feel about breaking up Walmart? How do you feel about breaking up, you know, Delta? I, I need, I, I need a, a complete, uh, a complete stance of where you stand on similar and adjacent issues. Secondly, I think uh, confinement and weighing, which those two things make up framing together. We'll talk about framing in a bit, but that's what are we and aren't we talking about and what's more important and less important to us among our points. Thirdly, I think characterization, that's a big one. People try to cheat with characterization. We'll talk how to do about how to do honest characterizations because lying with characterizations doesn't work, I think. Uh, probability and impacts. And I think one of my biggest like weaknesses as a, as a, as a speaker, the thing that we heard most as uh, feedback from good judges was that we, we were the sort of team that really cared about showing that the process leads to an outcome, but then we didn't really care about deriving the impacts. Like once it's clear that an incentive doesn't work and it works in the perverse way, we really didn't care about saying the five damages that are caused once the revert incentive works in a perverse way, but that's wrong. We should say the impact is very important, but I think a lot of teams do the exact opposite. They care a lot about the impact and don't care about the process at all. And the important thing is that you gotta have both. Uh, so now, by now I hope that some of you are persuaded that this case thing that I'm talking about, which is in some way distinct from having a bunch of points is terrific, but how do you find it? So I talked about this a little before, but you try to envision the world you try to think coherently about the world that's created and you try to see which points that you have gathered synergize, which of them work together. Then you 
make sure all of your burdens are crossed off if we're talking policy or if we're talking anything, right? But it's the clearest in policy. You make sure that you've done all your burdens and uh, controlling the, char the characterization. And the thing is, finding a case isn't about necessarily explicitly saying all of those things in prep. And we will workshop that in a bit so everybody can know what I'm talking about. But it isn't necessarily about finding it, like, explicitly discussing all of those things in prep, but rather about finding a coherent worldview from which the answers to those questions stem. So is that that so that's what that's why I'm talking about. Because once you know why you want to break up Amazon, that leads you to answers about whether you want to break up Facebook and Walmart. So not necessarily to discuss any, everything explicitly. Some people get get there easier from one way, some people get there easier from the other, but to find a coherent perception. So now that we've talked about a case, the next thing we have to do in prep is divide it up, right? Because we have a bunch of points. We've assembled them to a coherent worldview in some way. I know this is hard and I know there are only seven minutes. We'll talk about this in a bit. You've assembled them to some sort of coherent worldview and now you have to, sorry, you have to divide them. So, so, so the important divisions is you can do that in a whole bunch of ways, right? Internal structure, there isn't, one correct way to do it. So one, one way is to focus on having like your initial premises, then your analyses, then your conclusion, and then draw a whole bunch of impacts from them. Another way is to like do uh, uh, premise analysis, impact, premise analysis, impact. It is important to impact all of your things. I, I know impact is by the way, grammatically not a word, but I think debating is too far gone with that grammatical error for me to fix it. Uh, so I just get annoyed by myself, but it's fine. Uh, and don't take any burdens you don't need to. Like too many people try to either solve world hunger or cause nuclear war from side opposition, right? And and it's much better to take realistic and fair burdens. In fact, I think uh, Omer Nevo once told me that, that almost the best feedback for every debate he judges is just to ask the person, but do you really believe that? Do you really believe what you said? And oftentimes the end, the answer would be no. And the reason the answer would be no isn't necessarily because the logic is unsound or because the point is bad or because the premises are flawed, but just because you've overstretched them in your willing, in your like desire to argue as strongly as possible. So don't overstretch. Uh, now that you should have this at eight minutes in, so seven minutes left, I think it's really, Less than seven minutes is when I feel the speech starts to suffer. Uh, I think this, by the way, shouldn't vary so much with experience because if you are less experienced, then you should probably just do less material and have that take seven minutes both to prepare and to say. If you are more experienced, you shouldn't have necessarily more material, right? That's wrong, but you should have material that's more carefully arranged and worked together. So, so I don't think that the need for time is not the thing I found to, like as I've gotten more experience. As I've gotten more experience, I haven't been like, you know, analyzing points now takes four minutes. It's been pretty much constant throughout my, my experiences in debating. So I think about seven minutes is when it starts to suffer. Six is still workable. Five is very difficult. At four, you're just causing yourself pain. Like you will speak for seven minutes, but a lot of it will be in circles. A lot of it will be beating around the bush. A lot of it will not be as good as you want it to. And it's important to remember that it's better to have a wonky case at 8.30 or nine than to have the perfect case at 11, which is just useless. That's just a waste of a, waste of a good case. So I think know when to cross your, know when, when to set your lines. And also if you're nowhere near at seven or eight, then you know, cut it off and run run with what you have. Maybe the second speaker will be able to think of more things. Uh, if you feel like you're almost there, maybe stretch another minute. But if you're nowhere near, then stretching another minute is actually the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is to say, okay, this is what we have and this is what we're gonna try and win with and just analyze that as well as you can. Because to be fair, emotions are not like that cryptic. Usually the lowest hanging fruit that you will be able to locate in eight minutes of prep will be relevant to the debate and executing them competently is often more valuable than finding like the perfect case especially especially considering you know 
people would drag them, themselves to hell and back to get the point between second and first, but they almost never care about the point between fourth and third. And that point is worth the same. It's worth just as much. So, you know, it's important to have something. People oftentimes look for the first, but they don't really think about like someone else is also probably struggling with this motion. And by doing a competent job, we can almost always secure one or two points. Um, working, so next two things is how to work with your partner and how to analyze and prep. So how to analyze and prep. This is a tip, tip that I got from Yair Haros. So shout out, uh, Yair is great. Uh, which is to, the way I found it best to do it is to do top down which is that I start by writing down my points from the big steps and the big links. So what I used to do, and I think what a lot of people do, is to analyze a point like this, like next line, why, 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 so, why, prove it, why, right? You, 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 I'm hoping people have heard of like this way of analyzing points. So just like Socratically ask yourself questions while aiming for the conclusion. If you do it like that, then half a point is useless because you're left with a giant glaring, very obvious leap in the middle of your argument that you won't necessarily be able to make up as you go along. The way I found it best to do it is that you go outside in. So you have your three big logical moves as a part of that, uh, of that point, and then you start working the internal links. Then you start, uh, th then you start doing the internal part. Again, as we'll workshop again, remind me of this and I'll, and I'll explain uh, and I'll, I'll explain how I see it done. I just can't like really come up with a point uh, so easily off a blank to try and explain it. Uh, how do you work with your partner? So you pretty much stop talking with your partner, at least the way it works for me, about seven minutes in. Uh, PM speech is always prioritized in prep. DPM has more time, DLO has more time. First speech is always prioritized. That means I don't believe in saving points for the second speech unless that emerges organically, like unless you organically have too many points. I believe in stuffing everything in the first speech and, and, let, and letting the, the, the second speaker respond to the debate and have more time to do what they're uniquely positioned to do. Uh, that also means that if I need help with something, if I need an analogy, if I need an example, if I need a way to do a specific link, then I ask my partner and they pretty much leave everything and come to help me because I have to be up there in four minutes, right? So, so I think that's the right prioritization. That time where the partner has seven minutes to be thinking by themselves is also when we introduce the things that we told you not to think about too much from before. This is when like they start thinking about engagement with opposition. This is where they start thinking about like clashes and obviously they ought to do that before but this is where you really dig in like i think it's obviously important to understand where the clash is going to be in the debate and we can't discuss that in a bit but i think people too many times do a whole back and forth with their partner in prep like but what if they say this then we say this and what if they say this and then we say this every argument in debating has rebuttal if your comment on an argument that somebody offered is a rebuttal then you know Every argument in debating has rebuttal. That's not a reason not to do it necessarily. Uh, but that's the time where I think the, the, the second speaker can sort of take a deep dive into what the other side and how the other side is thinking and also look for blind spots in the case. If those blind spots are big, we will stop everything and try to fix them. If they're, they are like so glaring that LO can just basically bury PM in their, in their first two minutes, then you probably should stop everything and fix it. Uh, if not, that's what you have a second speaker for. You know, you can fix it as they go along. So Tom would tell me something. You tell me, but what do we do? So I, I have this problem. What do we do if they say this? Then, and I'd either say, okay, I'm working that in, or I'd say, okay, you should probably solve that. Uh, and 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 I think yes, the second part of prep is hierarchical to me in that sense that everybody has to work together so the first speech works because it's really close. Um, and also one thing, which is how to run uh, analysis that comes from your partner. So the way that oftentimes you end up doing it in like pro-ams or, or situations where it's effectively a pro-am, 
uh, is that someone during the minutes of an of like development and analysis gives the argument. That way, though, you don't have two preps. So that's a little problematic. It hurts the team most of the time. What you really want to do is get like the logical outline of the argument and some keywords that they would want you to use when running this argument. Uh, so. And, and sometimes an example or an analogy really helps you understand where they're going for and then construct it alone. So that's pretty much my overview of prep time and how it influences uh, the PM speech. Um, any questions about that? So I have one question in chat, I'll answer it. And meanwhile, you should probably ask, uh, think of other questions. Why does stance matter? Because everybody knows we are on side opposition. So everybody knows we're opposed to this one thing. But as I said, stance isn't about opposing this one thing. Although I've seen, right, like opposition teams that don't even oppose the one thing they're supposed to oppose. We'll talk about that later when we talk about counter props, which I don't love. Uh, but But it's important to know how you stand on related questions because those will come up and, the, and also because those clarify your principles, not principles. Principles in, in debate has become a code word, word for non-consequentialist argumentation. That's not what the way I'm using principles semantically. I mean like the, the first principles, the guiding principles of the construction of your of, of the thing that you believe of your argument. So in, in that sense, I'm looking at like free market as a principle, right? Even though you can't just be like, not in the laissez-faire libertarian, again, non-consequentialist way, but just that's a principle that you're constructing. So, so, so yes, I think that is quite important. When we'll look at some motions, uh, I think it will become clearer. So yeah, we're gonna talk later maybe about, uh, for example, this house would pay reparations to African-Americans. I think it's quite important to ask yourself how you deal with other minority discriminated or POC or gender discriminated or in general discriminated groups because if you wanna give everyone reparations, that's fine. You better have a coherent case that supports that. And if you don't, then you better know your distinctions. Secondly, can you explain more how to analyze? Yes, this will be in a minute. Uh, and okay. I'm uh, normally PM and PP. The problem we face is analyzing principled arguments. The feedback coming on my materials being scattered. Uh, I won't be talking directly about principled argumentation because there is a lot of material on that online. Uh, but, uh, or maybe at the end, if you still have questions and we still have time, I just wouldn't, it's a whole thing. Like I can't really answer that in, in two, two minutes. Uh, but, uh, but I think definitely being organized would would help. And, and the way to be organized is to understand the underlying internal logic of your case. We'll talk about that in a second when we talk about the speech and uh, therefore use that. How do I organize notes? So my personal system and guys note systems are very, very personal. You like what works for one person is not what works for another person. I've seen wild variations at like the top of the tabs of, of major tournaments uh, in notes. I do a separate piece of paper for every argument just because that's the only way I can keep them apart and keep them organized. And then I start developing them from the outside in. So if I have a point about, you know, this, the, this stimuli or, or this message, this message will be well received by by uh, people. So let's think about a motion with a message argument. Can anybody give me a message argument and a motion? Let's do the motion. Uh, this house uh, re opposes. This house opposes uh, commemorations in uh, post-conflict societies from uh, Zagreb UDC, right? So not to have like commemorations of the war and, for example, uh, Croatia. So a point in that could be those commemorations lead to a rise in national sentiments. The way I break up the big links in that point is not by going from the top to the end, but by understanding that the big links is how the commemorations look, different types of group who view that commemoration, what do they know about the world, and what do they understand when they see the commemorations that we described how they look, and then 
what behavior that leads to. So I first write down those four steps from the outside in with a lot of space on the page between them. So I write how the commemorations look, how they're received by nationalists, how they're received by ordinary people, how they're received by pacifists, whatever. Although like I don't really like these trichotomies, but fine, whatever. Uh, and then what behavior does that lead to? And then I start analyzing internally. And also note, if I were stuck with a complete analysis of how these commemorations look, but then I wouldn't have anything else, and I had to make that up as I go along, that would be very difficult. And I could go like this, I could get lost in being non-directional in the way that I speak. But if I have the outline, then making up as I go along, as I go along how the commemorations look is actually really easy, right? If I'm standing and all I have on the paper is how do these commemorations look, then I think I can easily say there are a lot of flags there. Flags rise up, uh, flags like flare up nationalist sentiments in people because they're symbols that are associated strongly emotionally. There are a lot of speakers there. The speakers are the heroes of the war, people who are quite significant in the war. There are a lot. So those are the sort of things that you can sort of imp improvise, I guess. Makeup is a bad word. Improvise as you go along. Um, so how do you structure a speech or flow of points? So as I said, every point needs to meet the burden of at least answering a main burden and, uh, and they need to be ordered in a way that's logical. As I said, that varies from debate to debate. Uh, we'll try to workshop a little bit of that. The speech itself. So first of all, and this is probably the most important part of, of the entire talk. This is like the part that I, I think mostly I came here for. The first minute of the PM speech is critical and most speakers I see waste it. Most speakers I see just use it to say things that are not really influential emotionally or, 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 or perceptually, and on the other hand, are not really analytically uh, have a lot of weight. Now, if you look at the PMs that you like, the PMs that you value, and let's like put aside people who sort of power speak a little more because that's not what I'm talking about in this in this uh, sort of uh, in, the, in this talk, right? If that's a path you want to go down, there, there are other people, I guess. I've never power spoken. I don't really believe in it. And if it works for somebody, that's, I guess, fine. Uh, that is fine. Uh, the first minute is critical. And with the PMs that you probably value, like Bo is a classic example, right? Bo Seo. Uh, Michael Shapira, if you've seen a lot of him, Will Jones, with those people, that minute itself wins by itself a tremendous amount of the debates that they're in. That minute itself where Bo gives that opening to the like famous uh, Saloniki final, we may rewatch it in a few minutes, I don't know. Uh, I'll decide later. Uh, it almost wins the debate. It sets apart what is at the end of the day, the rationale for victory, which is these people have the principled imperative to rise up against the system regardless of consequences. And if you look down that specific debate, that's actually the thing that's never answered. That's the reason the panel called that, that debate that specific way. So what should, let's start with, with what you shouldn't do. That's always easier than what you should do. So what you should never do, I think, or try to never do from now on, is to say, I'll have three points. One, this is, a, so let's like take the capital punishment example, right? Because I think it's when you do things like that, it's best to take the, the debates that we completely know inside and out, just so we can focus on method and not on content. Because if I focus on content, then you guys are gonna be like, okay, he's so good at making up content, but I won't make up content like this. So what we shouldn't say is say, I'll have three points. One, it's unjustified. Three, it's not deterring. And four, and two, it's not deterring. And three, it corrupts society. The thing that is slightly better than that, but not much better, is the sentence that is those three points, which is the death penalty is unjustified, it doesn't deter people, and it corrupts society, which is why we must oppose it. This is better stylistically, it's an improvement, but it's still not there. It's basically the same thing. Now, how do we present a case against the death penalty? given that those are our three points. How do we construct the sort of framing which makes that impactful, both logically and emotionally? Any ideas? Take like 20 seconds to think about that.
Anybody want to have a try? I think it's really useful to try. I think we can set the context for the debate normally. Like what I'm taught is that for the first opening line, you should actually state what is the problem with the status quo and then directly state out your stance before going deep in depth into anything. Give it a whirl. Uh, for, for the motion? Yeah, yeah, give it a try. If you will, you don't have to. Oh yeah, currently, I don't know. Let's okay. Save it. okay, then then I hope you at least thought about it. So uh, my idea for it is, so what you wanna do is you wanna make it big. You wanna give it gravitas. You wanna, debating is both a game, but it's also acting. So you play and you act. This is something, by the way, I took from Monica. And by the way, everything that I know from debating, I took a lot of it from other people who are very, very talented as are all the people I mentioned in this talk. So you wanna make it big, you wanna, you want it to be something that you care about. And so many teams I see, they, they come on the stage and they barely look like they even care about this motion. And, and you wanna make it something that you care about. So the way I would go here is, I'm sorry that my notes are positioned in a way that I'm not looking at the camera, but capital punishment is essentially the state committing manslaughter just to fail miserably in achieving deterrence and end which would be immoral even if it were achievable. And it is cold-blooded state murder that's meant only to appease a misguided public that's become so just because it craves blood precisely because it was corrupted by the state. Which is why we'll talk to you about A, why regardless of consequences, the capital punishment is simply unjustifiable. Secondly, why it's inefficient in achieving deterrence and ineffectual. And thirdly, why it corrupts the public in ways which A, hurt us outside the scope of capital punishment, but B, create a self-feeding, self-reinforcing cycle of violence, which feeds political capital into the desire for capital punishment. Now I hope that's something you care more about. Now I hope that's something, and, and most crucially, now that's something that if I can prove that, then you will be persuaded that I won. And this is also, I think how we deal with a lot of something that came up a lot in the questions on the Google form is how do we like not fall out of the debate? By the way, if, when you're judging, never use this expre expression. It's bad. It just means that 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 you you're not actively weighing. You're just talking about try to be more direct. Uh, the way to like not be forgotten in the debate is to prove something that everyone accepts that if it's true, you've won. And then when people don't deal with you, the judges will remember that you've set out to prove something that, that's a winner by itself. And that way you can make people have to engage with you. And once people are engaging with you or rebutting you, A, in the minds of judges that are sort of like intermediate and can forget about your arguments, that, that puts you in the loop, that makes you an important team in the round. Again, that's not how you should judge, just how sometimes people judge. And secondly, and, and secondly, uh, that means that you can engage back, that you can give POIs, that people have to take you for POIs if they wanna be good. Uh, how much should we divide to rhetoric? So I think rhetoric is important, especially in first speeches, especially in first speeches. Uh, but I think it's most important at the beginning of the argument and at the end of each point. So I want at the end of each point, bottom lines to be highlighted rhetorically, emphasized stylistically, make a big deal out of it, and at the beginning of, of the case. So how do you find this sort of framing? So one way to do it is a joke. I think jokes are sort of less the way to go for most PM thing, for most PMs, because uh, again, you should sort of sound like you really care about the debate. So doing a joke about it sort of undermines that. For other speeches, that's sometimes useful. Uh, we'll talk about how we come up with the intro and there's a question in chat. So we'll talk about how we come up with the intro uh, in a little bit, but it is important uh, to say that yes, we write it all completely in the language that the debate is held in. So in English, if the debate is in English, because this is where you wanna get your word choice right. Word choice is very important in rhetoric and in big letters. And I often use a separate paper that's just framing in Mac, no points yet just so that I have like, this is the beginning of my speech and it's written very clearly. 
So how do you find these sort of framings? So I think uh, jokes are sometimes useful. I think they're less congruent, like less useful in uh, in PM. I think oftentimes a way to look for that is to say, what's changed? Why do we need the motion? So it's sort of story about once the world was okay, but now it changed. So now we need the motion. I have a um, video example again. I'm sorry that it's of myself, but a video example of of myself from, oh no, what's happened to Zoom? Okay, Zoom just did something very weird. Now I only see one of you. Okay, 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 great, back to normal. Uh, so uh, so the, the motion was, uh, this house regressed. Tallinn UDC semi motion. If someone can quote it exactly in chat, that would be useful. But this house regrets the boom in financial instruments of the 1980s or something like that. Uh, let me see if I can find the motion. Uh, yes. This house regrets the mass deregulation of the financial sector. I think there might have been an info slide, but you know, whatever. Uh, it's 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 basically basically the mass. So this is something that people have trouble a caring about. B. This is something that sort of it's one of the mo those motions that's very uh, vulnerable to us finding just a bunch of points, but not having them be. Stick, stick together, not having them make for a coherent whole. And so I think it's a good motion to demonstrate with. And and the thing I, I opened with then is to say, from opening opposition, was to say the time of Rockefeller and Carnegie is over. The time when you could have very rich magnets who were A, able to take on the level of risk, which was lower than of investing in industries and B, we're rich enough and handled enough of the wealth that they can take on these risks is over. Today, we have risks that are significantly higher, significantly more different than required deferring expertise and B, a lower concentration of capital sort of per billionaire because the economy has gotten so much bigger, which is why we need complex financial in instruments to distribute divide, and divide risk and to enable everyone to participate economically. And now before I've even given a point, I think you care more about this. You understand the context for why this debate was even set, for why I'm opposing, for why I think mass deregulation in the financial sector was good. Another way to, so, so that's sort of the first way to find framing is to say, then and now, like why now? So that's the first way. Second way is to take it from, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, from the example to the general, like from, from, the, from the, the small case to the general case. So there was a motion about uh, uh, whether uh, developing states should subsidize academic studies for women al alone or I think develop, and, and sort of the comparative is to develop the economy. So the thing Monica opens that speech with is to say the washing machine has liberated more people than, acad than, uh, than academia. So again, we take this example and we find a case that's clear enough and sharp enough that we can use it. And then we can sort of have, have, a, have a sort of thing to latch on. Another idea is uh, there's a motion that we really get a lot in Israel because it's something that used to happen a lot in Israel, which is that you need uh, to have a English sort of uh, hiatus time. How would you say that? A time where you can't get into politics after you've left the media. So the way to open that, spe that, that speech is again, through an example to say, there is someone in my living room giving me the truth every day. They're the person that the entire family sits around. They're the person who is the origin of truth. They're the person who we rely on, not only for information, but also for comfort, also for knowing that the sun will rise tomorrow, to know what's going on, to know what's happening. When that person transitions into politics, they hold tremendous advantages from our emotional attachments to them and to seeing them as such a credible and consistent source of information. 
So again, an example of how to use it from example to the general. And if I would have given that in Hebrew, I would have given an example of the specific person, which that was. Yair Lapid, for everyone who cares, used to be uh, a prominent uh, media figure. So uh, another way to do it is a metaphor. So uh, there used to be a motion that used to be quite common about whether the trans community should perceive itself as, as part or should uh, present itself as part of the feminist movement writ large. So I think a useful metaphor for that is to go from being a medium fish in a small pond to being a tiny fish in a pool of sharks. So within the LGBT community, how the trans community is able to garner influence to garner power and to be able to leverage that movement's aims, but within the wider feminist community, it wouldn't be able to do that because there are more powerful forces acting in, in, in that context. Like for example, you know, white feminism caring about what it cares about uh, uh, and, and other internal streams. As another way to do it, I'm sorry to like laundry list this, but this is the way I look at it. I look at it by looking for those things. First, you look for them intentionally, and then you get used to looking for them intuitively. Another way to do it is to do a perspective shift. So there is there there was a motion. It was it was the sci-fi semi in Israel, I don't know, three four years ago, but it was also the open semi-final in Thailand this year, Brave New World, open semi. Somebody nod if they remember. Great. Uh, it was the open semifinal, and the way Alon Van Dam, terrific debater, uh, opened that speech, uh, supporting. So, catch everybody up if nobody like knows uh, the Woody C motions by heart, right? Why, why wouldn't you know them by heart? Uh, it's a motion about whether we prefer the order of the novel Brave New World, which is everybody has a pre-assigned social cast and has their basic physical needs fulfilled, but also really limited choice, to uh, the current order in the Western world. And the way Elon opens that motion is by saying, right now in our world today, most people don't have any choice at all with regards to their social standing. They're streamed into a very precise path where the next action is almost always predetermined by the previous one. And every digression from that path leads to falling out and being greatly penalized by the system around you. Again, that's a perspective shift. We all thought that Alon is supposed to support the no choice world, but he says, no, look, the world already doesn't have a choice. And through the story, of course, this is not analysis yet. Alon has to analyze why that's true. But that opening tells us a story of a different perspective. People may maybe being more free by being free within confines than they are by being ostensibly free, but unable to pursue any of their negative liberties. Uh, and the last way that I'll mention to do it is analogy. Uh, so I'm sort of, the, the way I usually do this workshop is by showing a lot of video, but I'm sort of reluctant to do that because I know video in Zoom tends to be really, really a buggy thing. Uh, so maybe what I will do is just, mm, sort of debating with myself here. Maybe what I'll do is just, uh, share it later, uh, or maybe I'll show it now. Let's look for things. Okay. Okay, so 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 what he does is essentially uh, make a comparison between a uh, motion is this house would break up big political parties. Uh, I don't remember if in the developing world or not. Uh, and what he does is the monopoly analogy. He says, in business, when you, when you have one party or like one body that is able to, that is so big it controls the majority of the, the market, it is able to eliminate all competition by utilizing the power that it gains from its size. In business, we call that a monopoly. And what we do is limit it and break it up. In politics, there is no answer to that. And therefore, we think we should apply the same logic. Does it in a better way? Because, you know, it's pretty good. Uh, OK. And, and like the secret tip here is that that also helps build the case. Like I think framing is often the conceptual heart of the case, or it should be. And then sometimes once you find framing, 
This is not necessarily to say that you should nail the framing before you even get to the case. But once you find framing, that sort of makes the internal construction of the case magically better. As you're saying it on stage, as you're improvising on stage, because BP is always improvisational, you will never write down every word that you say, especially not in PM, but you shouldn't in any position. That improves the improvisation because it leads to a deep internal understanding of what we're saying and why. So that's the thing called framing, which is a bit of a meaningless term in debating, right? Just what's framing? I don't know, maybe the first minute of your speech. I, I never was able to pin that specific jargonistic term exactly, but I think that sort of correlates with what framing originally is like, in, right? Like in political science, I didn't learn political science. I only took intro, intro to political science, but what I was taught there is that Framing in the context of political science and communications is controlling the interpretational framework, which the facts and narrative are then constructed into. And that's sort of what emerges. That, that our, our opinions are also emergent from that. And I think that's also what real world arguments are all about, right? Because oftentimes this is Hannah Arndt uh, said that, that oftentimes most people will agree about the facts but the entire difference will be an in interpretation. That's sort of like gotten, now people also like to disagree about the facts more than they used to. Uh, but, but I think that's still true, especially for the kind of disagreements that are presented in debating where fake news is not so much of a thing. Uh, and, and, and I think whenever we look at the real disagreements in society, almost always a fact for either side will never change an opinion. And the reason for that is because we're framed in an interpretational structure where every fact is constructed into the narrative. So one tragic and famous example of that is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? Where whenever there would be a, a conflict between a Palestinian and a soldier, then always the uh, people are at least uh, national, I don't know if to say nationalistic, for sure nationalistic, but also national but not necessarily nationalistic people on the Israeli side would see that as feeding into the story of uh, 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 violence. And the people on the other side would see that as feeding into the story of occupation. Not here to take sides on that. I think that that's not my job here and it also would be unfair to all the people that can't argue with me on the other side. But I think it's a really good example to see how you get another example you get another factual data point, but nobody changes their opinions because they just fit that into the story that they already believe. Same thing with Trump, right? He kept doing those things and the liberal side of the equation kept anticipating that this straw would somehow break the camel's back, but that was just incorporated into a narrative structure that's true for that. Police brutality, again, not gonna take a stance on that. Uh, 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 no, but note that the pro-police side of that argument will always tend to construct a story which fits into the wider narrative, which is why is being a policeman hard and that reaction made sense. I think that's quite tragic. Uh, I think you shouldn't behave that way in real life when constructing your opinions, uh, but, but it, it also goes to the power of influencing framing, which is the power to construct the words and the stories with which the rest of the facts of the debate are contextualized. And I think that power is not is, is the greatest in prime minister speech, because that is when we set the rules and the words that people will use for the debate. So whenever I have to support a program, I always try to make up a name for that program if that program wasn't in the motion. And if they led me into a specific name and that name is not good for me framing wise, I would rebel against that name. So uh, for example, there was uh, ugh, very recently, what was it called? Uh, Tech Open uh, final, semi-final. Does any of the Israelis remember? There was, there was one uh, where Tech Open final, do you remember? Eyal, want to give me the motion or, or a basic approximation of it? Yes. Oh, yes. A... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, it was whether we uh, regret or not uh, or support or something, a uh, deposit activity court that means that yes. you... Exactly. If I support the what the CA team called the cult of productivity, you can bet 
I will not be calling it the cult of productivity. Because once we call it the cult of pro productivity, we've already framed these people into acting irrationally, not being conscious, not making correct choices. That makes the debate incredibly hard to win because then when people ask themselves, do I believe analysis A or B, then the word cult is just sitting there like a, 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 a virus or a bug in their mind, influencing what they find plausible and less plausible. I would call it a pro-productive lifestyle or, or an actively productive lifestyle or a self-improving productivity focused life or something other than cult. Because if the word is cult, then you are losing. Uh, so, and, and the same goes for a lot of these things. We've also had a whole bunch of these motions lately, right? Like defining decade, uh, being the ESL final and a, a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, you wanna make sure uh, uh, that, um, so 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 let's let's take an example. Uh, there there was a motion uh, a while ago uh, about having a literal birth lottery. Again, I don't necessarily want to call it a literal birth lottery. Maybe we want to call it fair randomized birth. Maybe so so you want to control the things and the, the language that's being used. I think again the Thessa final is a really perfect example because Bo there. By the way, there is a lot of more about this in a workshop Monica gave about word selection, but I think it unfortunately wasn't recorded in Athens. But if you were there, then lucky you. Uh, Bo hides a great amount of violence be behind a certain type of language. Because what are we talking about? Essentially, a violent revolution, killing most people in that auditorium and possibly their children. But what that's hidden behind is a language that obfuscates that reality, that obfuscates that fact, that talks about it as metaphorically, as like the breaking of chains or the rising up against an oppressive system without talking into the nitty gritty details. If you're up and you come up, you wanna show the pain, you wanna show the blood uh, because otherwise it will be very hard to win when violence is talked about in such abstract terms within the debate, makes, uh, makes different things. Uh, same, uh, same thing, again, a video example I was thinking of giving is uh, replacing judges uh, with, with AI. So that was the ESL final in Cape Town Worlds. A uh, good speech there by uh, Alexander from uh, Moscow. And I think what, he, a lot of good speeches, right? But that's the one I'm talking about. Uh, and, and what he talks about is he says, every day, unaccountable bureaucrats decide for us, which is, a word choice that if now we can get everybody to say bureaucrats, if now we can say bureaucrats, bureaucrats, unaccountable bureaucrats, then software starts to look good in comparison because these are already people making arbitrary decisions. These are already people who are unaccountable. These are already people who don't owe anything to you. So I think I think that's again, another perfect example. So what do we wanna frame? We wanna frame our mech or, uh, you know what, I'll, yeah, we want to frame around our mech, our stance. We want to frame around our metrics, which are really important to analysis debates, but I'll talk about them in a second if I forget. And if I forget, you can ask. Talk about characterization. We'll frame about characterizations. And again, as I said, example choice is being important to set context. Now we'll talk about the mechanism. Uh, before I talk about the mechanism, any other questions? If there are general questions about the lecture, just keep them at the end. If there are questions about this segment, I'd love to have them. Okay, so the mechanism, uh, how do you choose it? When do you choose it? So my rule is be smart and don't be a smart ass, uh, which is just try and be fair. Find a way which is the sensible way which a government would have done this in real life. And I think something that happens with a lot of debates recently is that just remember, like don't, there have been a lot of debates recently where both sides just to try to co-opt the same middle ground for their side. So let's take uh, the example from, I think, Athens. This house would teach children to be skeptical of parental authority. What I think a lot of debates in that round saw was both sides trying to say, no, we're the side that says, listen to your parents, but have healthy skepticism about what they say. And that leads to debate that, debates that are, A, quite boring to judge, but B are unpredictable in outcome. You're, you have no control. And also C, they tend to 
that's pretty that's a good thing to have happen if you're back half like if front half is very confused about who co-opts the middle ground they both want that's usually a debate that you can fit yourself into quite nicely by resolving that i think the way you avoid that that idea of everybody tries to co-opt the same middle ground is don't use your mechanism to try to steal something that actually belongs to the other side, which is all the OG teams, which were like, okay, we'll teach children to be skeptical of parental authority, but of course we'll also teach them to listen to their parents because they're important authority figures. We'll just teach them to have healthy skepticism about it. That makes for a debate that's barely a debate, I think. Uh, and what you want to do is be fair. What you want to do is say what the sacrificial lamb, this is again something I got from Michael Shapiro, which is every debate has a site, sacrificial lamb, it has something that your side is sacrificing and you need to be willing to acknowledge it and minimize it by using analysis and not by using the mechanism. And that's why if you want to go up there in, in, in OG, you want to say something like, we will be teaching children to be skeptical of their parents. Of course, we won't be teaching them to blindly rebel against everything their parents say, but we recognize that by teaching them to exact their own thought and being skeptical of parents, sometimes they will disobey parents in cases where that's rational. We think symmetrically on the other side should also be fair to us and say, when they teach parental obedience, there will be cases where children should be skeptical of their parents and won't be. That middle ground doesn't belong to anybody in this debate. We are the side that says it's better to err on the side of caution. It's better to be more skeptical or to err on the side of skepticism, sorry. It's better to be more skeptical of your parents, to be more suspicious, and let other figures and, and processes correct for that than to blindly believe what they say, which can be a lot more dangerous. And now that helps everybody. Now there's a debate. Now there, there is something to be had other than two sides trying to just arguing, having exactly the symmetric, the same stance, but just arguing whether it's on side gov or op, which I've been seeing a lot of. Uh, analysis itself is, yeah, no different than any other speech. I can, I guess I can, there were some questions in chat, but but I guess I guess there, I, I could talk about how to analyze points, but, but that's sort of a concept that's separate from that. I don't think it's much different in PM or in first speeches than in other uh, speeches. I think it, you should, go for reasonable impact. An argument is always a sliding scale where the bigger you go for impact, the smaller the probability of that happening. And I think the way to be safe is to hinge the majority of the weight on something that is very reasonable. And then if you want to get the bigger impact, say, then this could also happen. This is also plausible that it will happen. It won't surely happen, but if it happens, it's a big deal, so we care about it. So. Make sure you can, if you want to construct big impacts, make sure you also have a pyramid of like lesser, but also likelier impacts. Uh, and the last question that I get a lot uh, giving this workshop, so I'll deal with is preemptives. So people always ask me about preemptives. I, I say, if your preemptives are about the sacrificial lamb, if your preemptives are about the core thing that your side is giving up in this debate, if that's backlash in many debates, if that's, uh, if that's in, in a sort of a, a mass surveillance debate, that's privacy, then yes, you want to deal with that preemptively because that's very clearly going to be a clash in the debate. I wouldn't preempt specific arguments. Like for example, in a debate about uh, trying a blank. So, so I, I wouldn't preempt a specific argument or, or, or a specific line of argumentation because then oftentimes opposition just won't go there at all and you'll end up wasting a lot of time. How does the case help me in construction? That means that I now have like the skeletal structure of the case. I have the schematic structure of the case. I see it, I see the links and that means that I can A, prioritize between them and B, focus on how to fill them. And 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 so and so that that's my lo big logical move that if i do it right i will be able to do a complete case that is a winner last thing is about style i think prime minister in prime minister pacing is even more important than in other uh speeches uh what i usually what i often like to say is that uh it's sort of so i i kind of like rap music uh so so it's a little like a rap song but the pacing isn't rap rap god the pacing is lose yourself so you want to slow down especially for your intro 
and bottom lines. So that's also true for lose yourself, right? But never mind. Uh, and 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 you want to keep a steady pace. You don't want to run. You don't want to mumble. You don't want to stumble too much. You want to try to keep a steady pace. That's, I think, my number one advice for most prime minister speeches that I hear is slow down. Do less. Do it better. Do it more intentionally. Do it more purposefully. You'll be doing a lot better. Uh, now I'll answer some questions in chat, and then we'll workshop some motions, and then we will talk about leader of op. My estimated length for this workshop is probably going, that it's going to end in about, or at least the constructive part of it, it's going to end in about 30 to 40 minutes, I think. So questions in chat. Did I miss anything? Uh, okay, another possible point uh, for Capital punishment, yeah, that's a different case. It's also coherent, like that capital punishment doesn't fill in the requirements of the penal code. What I would say is with capital punishment, oftentimes what people would do, and I think, again, it's a good example because we all know it inside and out, or maybe some of us know it inside and out, uh, is that people say, uh, there's something, I don't know how international this is, but saying the four purposes of punishment, which is uh, um, retribution, deterrence, uh, distancing from society. Sorry, I don't know how to say that in English and uh, rehabilitation. And then try to like go down that laundry list. And I think that's actually a really good example for how to miss in an argument because then you have an un four points, unprioritized, unweighted. It's very easy for A, opposition to decide which one of these is most important and rebut it, or B, to say for, for back half teams to decide which one is more important and construct it far better. And when you have a complete perception that also should have an internal prioritization of what's less and more important. So stay away from laundry lists and always ask yourself, what's really my reason? And, and, and when you have more reasons, make sure those reasons are sufficient to win. Not just like, there, there, are, there are arguments that I call like, I win more arguments, which are, if I'm already winning this debate, this is the reason why I win more. These are pretty much useless in debating because you, you, you want to, take the points. And also they, they don't lead much to the overall holistic persuasion of a case If something only persuades me more of something, but it's contingent on me being persuaded. Uh, le, uh, can I concisely repeat intros? Sure, I hope you're making a list. Humor, what changed, one, humor. B, what changed in the world? Three, from an example to a general principle. Fourth, metaphor. Five, perspective shift. Six, analogy. I know metaphor and an analogy have some overlap, but an analogy sort of takes more burdens of being true onto itself. An analogy should actually be more accurate and being analogous. A metaphor doesn't have to be. Like, obviously, the transgender community is not a fish. But, but when we talk about an analogy between a monopoly and a political party, then that should be quite analogous if we're going to make that analogy because people are going to attack that analogy if they think it's important. Uh, are there certain metrics that must be fulfilled in order to make a complete contextualizations? I don't think so. I, I, I am not sure uh, that that's the way I think about it. I, I don't think about my content. I don't think completeness and contextualization. Again, I first thing I like to say is, although I, I, I sort of make the mistake of using it sometimes, I don't really like jargon in debating. I think there's a lot of like emperor's new clothes vibe going on there, where we sort of use words like framing or contextualizations, but no one is really that accurate on what they mean. Uh, so I'm not sure what contextualization is, but but I think, uh, but I think, uh, but I think, uh, what you want is something that makes for a worldview that's coherent and understandable. I think that's the important part, and not necessarily to check off a certain laundry list. I think last thing is about analysis debates. Oftentimes, uh, it, so first of all, in hypotheticals and prefers a world, exactly what I said about the uh, skeptical being skeptical of children, uh, children being skeptical of parents, is very true for prefers a world. Tell me what you're actually sacrificing. Describe to me a fair way in which these two worlds actually differ. Describe to me something that also gives oppositions what to work with. Because if you don't give opposition fair weapons to go into this fight, you will have a semantic argument about what the motion means, and you will probably not win because it, nobody wins. 
uh, you may win if all four teams participate and then the judge has to pick one of them to win. Um, so, so that's the first thing. Second thing is metrics, right? Because what, what are metrics in that context? Uh, the sort of scales against which we use the way which side is winning. So liberty can be a metric, economic success can be a metric, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you wanna explain why those metrics are important. So, mm -mm. Let's workshop some examples. I'll take one someone asked in the Google form, just to be nice. Uh, so there was a motion. Uh, I believe the time when I heard it was Budapest Open 2017, which is this house would give guns to women and only women. So what are possible points for that? If anybody's willing to bite and participate. If nobody is, then the uh, collective punishment, which I will choose is that there will be no workshopping part and uh, fine, because I can't workshop with myself. I see one in chat, I would like more. Okay, now I have enough to work with. Thank you all for participating. Even though you didn't do it in sound, now I have to read it out, which is annoying. Uh, okay, so one idea, uh, again, in prep, there are no bad ideas. So I won't give any of your ideas flack uh, in, 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 in that way. I think all ideas are pretty much useful in prep. I think one of the things that do most damage to people's prep is self-censorship. You should be more open than prep and then after you say the things, uh, think about how good they are and whether they can be employed. So one, they can lead a revolution. Secondly, uh, more crimes are done by men. So men are categorically more aggressive. I think an important thing to take note to that is that doesn't necessarily tie back into the motion. It's a sort of an analysis on the way to a point, but it's not a point. The fact that most crimes doesn't are done by men doesn't persuade me to give guns to women and only women. Uh, Yes, uh, think about how good they are. Wait, uh, so self-defense from sexual harassment, I think that's quite interesting. Women are more in, da in danger of domestic violence, so that's affirmative action, increased deterrence, and can more, can more reasonably be trusted to use for self-defense and not aggression. I think that makes for a really good selection from which to construct what we look at, at at as a case. Uh, and the gun is a better self-defense weapons than other self-defense tools for women. And by the way, not necessarily sure that's true, but that is a thing that we will have to analyze, right? Because if the same self-defense ends can be achieved by giving them pepper spray, then that's probably bad for our case, bad for site government. So now how do we construct that into a case, into a world's perception? So I think you aimed at a few things. A really good so yeah, go ahead. Somebody wanted to say something. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Uh, so I think I think we have a, we have a few things that are emergent here. One is uh, self defense in domestic violence cases, and I think that that's important. That's a big thing that should definitely be part of our case. The second thing, second category you people said things into is we don't have a lot of the detriments that there are to gun ownership happen a lot less when women are the ones that own guns because women behave more responsibly with guns because women are less aggressive, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the third is societal impact, which the only thing we had for that is Maxwell saying they can lead a revolution, which is, I think, an example of taking a really big impact, uh, at least in like in, in, in most contexts, that's more work. Uh, but but I think I think that sort of from that we can see emerging our perception of the case, which is guns create power 
in every situation that they are introduced into. When they're introduced into domestic situations, they create power. They change the balance of power within that situation. How does that happen? A, crucially in those cases where domestic violence is an issue, guns make a big difference in deterring cases of domestic violence. Secondly, in stopping ongoing cases of domestic violence, even without the woman using it. And thirdly, in stopping cases of domestic violence with the use of the gun. We'll, we're going to have to explain each one of those three. And secondly, we think, crucially, that means that a lot of the demands of gun owners in general, the political pressure to own guns, uh, the desire, the, the advantages of gun ownership, if you accept that there are uh, some of those, that sort of depends on whether opgo for no guns or all guns, right? One of the problems of PMing that motion is that there are two opposite lines that opposition can take. Opposition can say, we want the right to bear arms, and opposition can say, nobody should have any guns. If we're doing a competition in Europe, it would be a sort of, I would guess they would go for no guns, but they can definitely go both ways. I think both ways are legitimate, uh, especially when you can do like reasonable gun ownership from op here. Uh, and, and then the last thing we say is this does have the advantages of gun ownership in like giving people the power back and like enabling self-defense writ large, but none of the disadvantages because disadvantages stem from specific types of uses that men do with guns. So I think the most one of the most important ones is self-harm. Another important one is domestic violence. A third important one is just within altercations which are at, escalated by this toxic masculine aggressiveness. And now I think we have a worldview. Now I think we don't just have a bunch of points about like, okay, but we have the impact of self-defense. How does that weigh against your impact of gun gets stolen and used by somebody else? But we've actually set apart, set, set out a logical comparative. And, 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 and yes, we, and, and recognizing that some bad things can happen when guns go into the hands of anyone women included, but we think a lot less of them happen than when they go into the hands of men. Uh, isn't it stereotypical to say that men are more aggressive and that women are less angry? If we say that that way in the case, then I wouldn't, I, I think it's not a useful characterization to call it stereotypical because that makes a value judgment that I think whether I'm into that or not, it's, it's not useful in the debate. It is an assertion, okay? If we just say that, then that is a, a, an assertion and it shouldn't count. But we are not going to assert it. We are going to explain in a nuanced way that in a culture of toxic masculinity, men are forced to, uh, are, are taught to aggressively assert themselves by using violence in many contexts. This manifests itself in the conflicts that men have with other men in which they are taught that de-escalating that conflict means that you're not a man, means that you're weak, has significant social penalty, but escalating that conflict is socially rewarded, which is what makes men aggressive towards men. When we talk about the aggressiveness of men towards women, unfortunately, a lot of men are taught they should be superior to the women, to women within the household, that they should be running the show. And then when they encounter the reality that there is another human person in that situation where they're, where they're, with their own desires and needs, oftentimes that mismatch between expectation and reality manifests itself in aggression. And that aggression is a million times worse when men have guns. So just because it's stereotypical doesn't mean A, it's not true, and B, doesn't mean we can't analyze it, but also we should always analyze it. We should never just be reliant on an assertion. I also think that it it, it is in most cultures, unfortunately, generically true that aggression is more uh, is more uh, cultured in men. The, the, the way do you call that when, you know, it's made to emerge in men. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think, yes, it's a stereotype. Type. I think in many cultures, it's a fair stereotype. And I think uh, we can present it in a nuanced, analyzed way. Uh, so a little bit, so, so, so I hope that sort of worked example helped you see a little bit what, what we want to do. And then the first minute of our speech should be something along the lines of what I said, except we write down every word and we get it exactly right, which is to say giving guns to women has a lot of the advantages 
so, so, so exactly what I said before, guns introduce power into a situation, enables responsible use in ways which prevent a lot more violence than they create, and thirdly, has a lot of extraneous benefits that we just mentioned. And, 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 so, and so I think that's the sort of framing that wins. A little bit about Elo. So Elo is first of all, like the leader of opposition. It's first of all, has the importance of being like the prime minister for opposition and then everything else. I think anybody who does it the other way around will find themselves tending to lose the back half and will find themselves falling into the sort of like hung case problems versus top half, like having things in DLO, pushed in DLO that they didn't push, which is to say, don't give five minutes or four minutes of rebuttal in LO normally. Rebuttal should be purposeful, like should be, uh, should, should be really uh, aimed at a specific purpose, should be really uh, lean. Secondly, I think rebuttal should be essentially negative. So I think the sort of rebuttal where you weigh your argument against what they just said, leave that to the to some of that to DLO because that's what they're for. The important thing is to negatively answer a point. Now, I think most of you, uh, at least the way I presented the workshop, should uh, probably know the difference between a negative uh, response and, and, and a parallel or not negative response. A negative response actually strikes at the logic relevance or bottom line of the argument, that it, it attacks the argument the way it was executed. And I think that also allows DPM to ping pong and then DLO to be in the debate. So don't rebut with something like, yes, but we have our point, or yes, but here's another scenario that could happen. Find an actual problem in the logical construction of that point and rebut that. It should be short enough, so I aim for like a minute and a half, two minutes, 2.30 if it was a really great PM speech, uh, but, but you want to get into your points, you want to get your framing, you want to get all of the things that are important to you, which also means you don't have to answer everything, you have to answer the strongest things. Last thing is about uh, one of the great lies of debating, uh, my rebuttal will be integrated. Uh, so I think that actually integrating rebuttal is the, the the position where you have the most trouble with integrating rebuttal is probably LO or DLO. Those are the two trickiest ones because you will almost always have a point that's directly rebutting the clash, which is why A, keep rebuttal negative. That way it's not inside your point, but also just a small tip that's really useful for that is to use a different colored pen and highlight within your argument they said this, and this is where the answer is inside my argument. So that's the way you make sure you do your integrated rebuttal. And what you write there is not the answer in red. That's the way to get it wrong. What you write there in red, in my case, is what they said. Because that reminds you to say, but PM said dot, 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 dot. And I reply to that. Because otherwise, and, and say the full thing that they said because something that we see a lot in judging. And they said the thing about efficiency, but that's wrong because no, that's not good enough. Your judges will not follow that. So you wanna say everything that they said. And perhaps the most important thing in LO is how to respond to, to framing and to a good PM. Because we just talked about how influential framing is, how powerful framing is, how important it is in determining the causes of the debate. So it's really, really, really important to ask ourselves whether we agree with the other side's framing. And if we do, and especially if we don't, how do we move it? And that's really hard actually, because you have to be reactive. You have to sort of work with the metaphor that you just heard three seconds, like seven minutes ago. You have to work with an analogy that you just heard seven minutes ago. But I think let's practice that. So I think if we were practicing against Bo's speech from, from, from Saloniki, uh, the Saloniki, um, this is like something that you've all, ugh, never mind. So, mm -hmm. as good a time to get a YouTube ad as any. Okay. Okay, let's get the first minute of that universally beloved national treasure of speech. Are you all seeing a dinosaur or Bocio? 
I can't see chat because I'm full screened. So somebody will have to be brave and say words. Ocio. Well, okay, good. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't think it's very audible, though. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I knew this was going to be, this was going to be a toughie. Uh, mm -mm. Can we see the dinosaur then? Uh, yeah, everybody who stays until the end will see the, the right to liberty and to self determination that we think inheres in the human <laughs> condition. How are we going to define a Marxist revolution in this debate? We say that in all its forms, it shares the feature of wanting to break down the system of private property. That's what a Marxist revolution means. It can take place in one of two ways. One is it can happen through internal systems that exist presently. That is to say that you vote in Marxist governments who support things like mass redistribution and the abolishment of private property, or it can exist externally in the instance of forcibly bringing down governments that for far too long have tread on these people's rights okay so we've talked a lot about how if that framing is accepted that debate is very hard to win and in the, indeed nobody else won it despite having very 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 good uh, speakers on all the other teams how do we respond to that how do we frame against that doesn't need to be perfect, doesn't mean we would have won the debate. It's just an attempt in the right direction. Well, like you said, it's a very abstract way of describing what is definitely a very bloody and, and, and terrible process for like the vast majority of the population, like enacted by what is probably a small minority of the population, which is the people that he's talking about in the like previous opening paragraph. So I think that's good. I would highlight within what he said, like for me, I would write down one, no alternatives, like no choice, right? Dictatorship, whatever. Two, how does he intend to solve it? Two A is vote in Marxist parties. It's not the motion, right? Okay, do that. We're obviously not opposed to that. And like maybe that's not the best idea, but it's legitimate and B, forcibly remove governments. And then what we need to go out and say is that despite presenting arguments, possibly in one of the most eloquent speeches ever heard, Bo glosses over two extremely important parts, or three even, right? The first is that the extent to which those people don't have alternatives it's very uncomparative, uh, and we could talk about that a little more, but that's actually the least important one. Secondly, being in a dictatorship of no alternatives, true as it may be, absolute as it may be, although we're going to disagree with how absolute it is, does not excuse you doing anything at all to anybody else. It is simply presumed that everyone else within that state who is not along for the ride is then immediately complicit. And if there was analysis for why it's complicit, this debate was a long time ago, but obviously we're going to rebut that analysis, right? And being locked into a terrible state in and of yourself does not give you the right to inhumanely kill or show a complete lack of regard for the humanity of other people who did not exactly choose to live in that system. And then Bo offers to the, this no alternatives, two alternatives, one vote in parties, fine, it's not the debate. B, forcibly remove governments, but behind that sterilized language is a burst of violence, which hasn't been seen in the, in the world probably since the second world war, is a burst of violence, which will kill unprecedented amounts of people, most of which did not elect per se, to live in ways that are so exploitative, which didn't have meaningful choice in that. I think that's the way we frame against that. 
and, and it's really important to frame against that because if we just accept the framing that we heard, if we just accept that thing, uh, then it becomes really hard to win the debate. So I, I, I think it's important to be reactive, not only to the points, because you can address the points, but to the case, to be reactive to that. So if we talked about alone in the Brave New World uh, example saying people live with no choice, how would you frame against that? People in the capitalist order already don't have any choice. Um, could you say that they at least they have some choice compared to zero choice? Exactly, exactly. Alon makes the crucial mistake of assuming that choice is binary, that you either have a choice and you're completely free or you have no choice at all and you're just a rat in a race. But choice is a spectrum and it's a spectrum in which the lives of epsilons in Brave New World are unimaginable to people living even at the bottom end of the spectrum, let alone the middle of the spectrum of current capitalist society. It's just wordplay. It's a comparison, but it does, but 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 it hasn't. It doesn't really represent the reality of choice that people do have. And yes, we know there's small mobility, but there is mobility. And we'll talk about how important that is. And yes, we know that choice is limited, but there is meaningful choice, and we'll talk about how important that is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's important to deal with the case of the case, with its strongest point, with its most influential point, and also with framing. So, uh, uh, no. Yes, sure. Could, could you maybe show the first minute of the LO speech in Tess uh, and sort of like point out? <laughs> no, the LO, speech, speaking down. The, the LO speech has not been recorded because of uh, reasons. Really? I'm sure I've seen it in like a full recording of the debate. Okay, I may be wrong. Is, isn't OO uh, Harish and Michael? No, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm fairly sure I saw LO once. Um, it's, it might be there. Okay, I'll, I'll look for it. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, uh, the, the Canon recording uh, doesn't have LO, I think. All right, thanks. I think it has Bo followed by Fanella. That's, that's what I got right now. Uh, so yeah, and also I wasn't there, so uh, I don't know. Uh, CG isn't there, but also LO isn't there for some reason, uh, I think, I think. Yeah, for the video I have now, that's true. Uh, okay, so. Um, mm, mm, uh, last thing I think is important because it's gotten fashionable since the last time that I talked about this, which is people have become really, really bullish on counter props and concessions. I don't love them, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the strategic counter props, which can concede half of the debate, uh, even though they've gotten quite popular. I think mostly the shtick that we're seeing is to narrow the debate as much as humanly possible and hope that surprises DPM so much that they won't react and that will leave bottom half to marvel at your brilliance when they have nothing left to contest because you've narrowed down the debate quite greatly to what is barely a debate. So I'm going to talk about why, when is it literally illegal? Why is it not a, the best idea? even when it is legal. So this is a little bit of a nerd out on the rules, but let's set things right. So I think Euros is coming close and Euros and Worlds both always clarify the manuals. And I think since counterprops have gotten so hot, we may be seeing a clarification heading our way on that specifically. There are trivially illegitimate counterprops that is a completely irrelevant one. So in this house would inv invade Syria counterprop have more POC characters on Netflix, right? Counterprop something completely unrelated. Uh, and there are counterprops which are not even excluding OG's model. So uh, in this house would invade Syria, then this house would invade Syria and also fund local pro-democratic groups. It's not a counterprop. Uh, but there are also cases which people think are legal, but I think are illegal, which is to make something which isn't, uh, which while it may be technically mutually exclusive to OG's model is not mutually exclusive to the motion. So if OG says, if the motion is this house would partition Iraq and OG says this house would partition Iraq into a Sunni and a Shiite state which each having half the territory, I know half the territory is silly, it's just for the sake of example. And then OO says our counterprop is to partition Iraq into a Sunni state, a Shiite state and a Kurdish state. For me, that's an illegal counterprop. Okay, 
So it's quite important to keep that. A lot of the counter props that I see done don't contradict the motion. I think these should be illegal. I think holistically speaking, they are unpersuasive to negating the motion. Hopefully we'll get a clarification and it'll all become clear, but that's what I think. And also you'll be taking your risk that your judge may think the same as I do. Now, why don't I believe in counter props? I think whenever you run a clever counter prop or clever, uh, you're essentially taking a risk. You're doing something that isn't necessarily persuasive holistically. You're giving up important principles of the motion and possibly many of the rationales that make side government work and you're admitting them to be true. And then you're just heavily reliant on the judge agreeing that what you did is very clever. So the first thing I'd like to say about how risky that is, is I think a wild risk. Unfortunately, judge level, ethos, language, gender, race, I think the more you try to do those things, the more you subject yourself to implicit bias. And unfortunately, I think something that you see working for top teams, which are automatically assumed to be clever, uh, won't necessarily work for you. And I always try to maximize my control of debate outcomes and minimize the room for bias and error. Uh, so, so that's the first reason. But I think just the second reason is that Ultimately, what you're doing is you're, you're admitting there, there's a problem and you're suggesting an alternative way to solve it, but oftentimes your alternative way to solve it is not necessarily, uh, is, is, not, is not really, it just has exactly the same faults. And then it's sort of hard to criticize for them because it has the same faults as they do, but they will end up criticizing it. And then you'll end up having a very low co persuasive contribution to the debate. And I think one of the smartest things, which I've heard again from the Will Jones Red Sea Open lecture is you're meant to please your crowd. You're meant to please your judges. Do the things that make your judges happy. Essentially, when you're doing something like this, a lot of the times what you're doing is trying to make your judge a little bit miserable, but forcing them to give you the win because of things you think you're getting right with the rules. But I wouldn't count on it. I think the best way to consistently win, especially when you're an underdog, especially if you're ESL, especially if you're two women, especially if you're, especially if you're one of those groups that isn't automatically assumed to be winning, uh, and I don't think bias is that big in debating, but it's definitely an issue, uh, is please your judges. Give the, give the people what they want. I, I think it's, it achieves much more effective, consistent wins. What are smart counter props? So I think natural opposition lines, especially when they're the natural opposition line in real life. So in this house with legalized prostitution, again, I'm taking a very like, so I think the natural opposition line that we all, that people who are against legalizing prostitution believe in in real life does include decriminalizing sex workers and going after clients and pimps. It's important to say, if you're saying we're decriminalizing everybody, that's a sneaky counter prop and you're, you're, you're I think, taking an unnecessary risk and it also has all the problems. Uh, but if you're saying I'm decriminalizing sex work for sex workers, but I'm also going even more after clients and pimps, then I think you're being very fair, you're keeping the debate still reasonable, and you're doing a counter prop that's actually, I think, smart. Uh, oh, one last thing I have here, uh, sort of disconnected an example of framing, uh, which is there's a famous uh, Tversky and Kahneman study, uh, two people who uh, got uh, the Nobel Prize for economics, uh, which is, it, it was very, very pre-COVID, so forgive the example, that's just their example for, from 15 years ago, but there is a plague about to erupt and there are two so what's presented to people is a question the first uh, type of people the first questionnaire get the question of there's a plague about to erupt you have two options alternative a saves 200 people and alternative b means you have a third of a 33 percent chance to save 600 people and a two-thirds chance of saving nobody that's group a group b gets a questionnaire that says a 400 people will die, and B, there is a chance of a third that nobody will die. In case you didn't follow along, those two are mathematically identical. It's also said that there are 600 people in like this town or whatever. Those two are identical, but they're just presented with a focus on death or a focus on life. As you can accept, expect, preferences were both 
having an overwhelming majority for one answer and be completely inversed in both cases. So in cases of people who got questionnaire A, most of them chose to save 200 people. In cases of people who got questionnaire B, most of them chose a chance of a third that nobody will die. This is despite, despite being presented with identical options. So I think one last good real life empirical example on the meaning of framing and how it often impacts even your judges and even the best of judges and why it's quite important. Uh, let me see, let me see. Think of questions for now, I'll take them in a minute. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Okay, somebody sent me a version that does have LO. So, uh, yeah, let's. Can we see it? Yes, we will. But, uh, oh, wait, I don't know if I shared sound. Okay, I am sharing sound. Bo wanted to champion China as an example for his side of the house, but the Maoist revolution in China condemned millions and millions of people to famine and poverty. In actuality, if you want to talk about lifting people out of poverty, it's only since China has since started to liberalize and allow a flow of capital into that country that people have lived better lives and will continue to live better lives into the future. We're going to do a number of things. We're firstly going to talk about why opening government have been completely misleading on the scale of what a global pursuit of Marxist revolution looks like. We think Marxist revolution in this context must be violent. Then we're going to look at the, the circumstances under which we think violence is justified. Thirdly, then, why this will be disastrous for the poor, for in the period preceding this revolution, during the revolution, and after the revolution, even if we assumed the level of success that they wanted to say would come about. So firstly. So I think uh, a big hit and a big miss, right? And, and, and that's why they, one of the reasons they end up not winning because it's good about how direct it is in framing and, and hopefully further down the speech in saying that it is violent, but it is outcome focused, thus missing the strongest logic that OG give. So what's missing, what it does exist in the framing that we gave here in the workshop uh, is the idea that it's also principally illegitimate to act upon people, which we highlighted, were not necessarily complicit to that extent in making you suffer. And that makes it principally illegitimate. Whereas that framing is really sharp on outcomes, but it's very outcome focused, which then lets second speaker for government say, but listen, your right to self-defense is independent of outcome which they're able to do quite persuasively. So that's, I think, the part that hits and the part that misses about that counterframing from LO. So I think it's a really good teachable example. Again, all of these people are great speakers. Being in finals is quite hard. Uh, this is not to like this on anybody specifically. I think there's something to learn from everything. Uh, any questions? So what exactly did he not, should he have done then those? So I think, yeah. There is a big focus on outcomes here, which is why it'll be bad for the poor, uh, but there isn't enough focus on why that makes the right to self-defense limited. And the way I would have gone here is yes, if someone is targeting you specifically and is threatening your life, I think your right to self-defense is and again, I'm working from that analogy because I think that analogy then becomes very powerful, both in the first speech, especially in the second speech. Then your right to self-defense against that specific person is independent of outcome. Even if you'll get injured in self-defense, even if what, it was better to capitulate, you still have the right to self-defense. But your right to self-defense doesn't extend to putting third party at risk, doesn't extend to acting violently against people who had nothing to do with it. And I think that's the focus that is lacking. To show that the people who this revolution harms are A, not complicit in your oppression, and B, don't really have a choice on whether to be affected by your revolution, and therefore you're 
right to self-defense doesn't extend to harming them in the process. So that's, that's, I think, what's lacking and what is overall a good job because the sticking point for OG in this debate is the independence of outcome, as it should be. Uh, cool, any other questions? Also, it is still very clinical about the violence, like at least in the part that we yeah, saw. Yeah, it's, like, it's a little clinical, but he says he'll be more explicit down the speech and then I'll just believe it. Uh, sometimes you have two, three or four absolutely separated points, but not contradictory, which can't be united by one worldview or one principle. How do you approach a PM speech in such a case? So first of all, try to make at least one of those worldviews stick in PM. And if that means putting the second one in second speech, sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I will advocate doing that. So if you have a principled case that's very strong and you want, and you think it will take all seven minutes, then find some of the practicality. Like if Bo and Fenella in that speech want to talk about practicality, that can go in the second speech because it's not an inherent part of the most important logical move they make. Secondly, I would ask myself, why am I running these separate points and what do they do in the debate? Is either one of them independently sufficient to win the debate? If so, I better say so explicitly. And I better at the end of every point say, and if you believe this, that means you have to give it. So that means that we win the debate. So try to be very explicit about that. Uh, so that's how I would approach it. But in general, I haven't found many examples of that. Like I found examples where prep leads to that and then just do what I just said. I haven't found many debates which have a rationale for existence, but for which there isn't a consistent worldview or a consistent set of reasons uh, to believe uh, that for. So last remarks, I think, I hope I've, I've, uh, I've been able, I was able to show you why I think what, what, what's the beauty in front of prime minister? Because you're there first, you have a constructed speech, you have the most time to actually speak about your case than any other speaker in the debate because you don't have designated time for a bill, you just have to take a POI. Also, please take a POI, please take a POI. Uh, you shouldn't not take a POI, I think. If people think that's a strategic choice, I think that's actually a bit of an unfair strategic choice. I sort of wish it was penalized more than it is or that all judges knew how to penalize it correctly. But A, if you penalize it correctly, that's not something you wanna do. Uh, but B, I don't think it's in good sportsmanship spirit. Call me scrub if you wanna. Uh, and, 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 also, uh, and also, yeah, that, that's a speech where you have the most power. And for me to hear everybody having to talk about our speeches, to be able to say that they stood on themselves and win the debate by themselves, to be able to construct the language that then everybody else uses for the entirety of the rest of that debate, that I think for me is the pleasure of the PM and the things that I love. Can I explain my 2017 EUDC final speech and break it down? Wow, uh, I am proud of that speech. I think, so motion is uh, this house, uh, as the Kremlin would present the Russian Revolution as a tragedy rather, rather than a triumph. And I think this is a really good case of when you you have a, this is, message has a ton of impact. Some of them are, are nice, some of them are not so nice. And, and, and they're sort of hard to collect together. And I think both what we do and both what GUU do, who then uh, I'll go on to win that debate, is assemble them in a way that is a coherent worldview. I was lucky enough to be reading a, a, a Putin biography called uh, The New Tsar at the time. Like, not lucky, right? I knew I was coming to Estonia, so I thought it would be interesting interesting to read things that, like relevant to that. And I thought that seemed to be an interesting book. So I was reading it, uh, but the book is called The New Tsar. So that's where he plagiarized uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, title for the rhetoric. And, and, and I, think, I think, yeah, that is all about asking, why was this motion set? Why now? Why this? Why the Kremlin? Uh, because it's something there's been a status quo. Not all of us know why it exists and why it is, it is that way. And so you have to look for 
why that that was the case and why that happened. And also try to find someone and tell them to uh, check your hair and that you don't have anything between your teeth before you come up. Otherwise, everybody will uh, view uh, for uh, a lot of time a speech that you have where you have a curl that looks like the Bamba baby. Google, Google it. Uh, OK. So narcissism time, yay. In the meantime, everybody cool. can think of questions. Vladimir Putin is the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin is the new Tsar. And canceling a narrative of an overthrow of the Tsar and romanticizing the time of those Tsars helps Vladimir Putin consolidate power, helps Vladimir Putin have the economic policy he wants, helps Vladimir Putin achieve more power in Eastern Europe. And those will be my three points of analysis today. So firstly, a little bit, of, a, a little bit about the mech. We suggest a complete rejection of both revolutions of 1917. We want statues of, of, of Lenin and, uh, and, of, uh, and of Stalin removed from state institutions and from cities in general. We want all of those symbols out of Russia and we will teach in schools and we will preach in television that every single part of the 1917 revolution was a tragedy that cost the lives of billions of people and facilitated a regime which was worse than the glory times of the Tsar. To contrast that, we will romanticize and emphasize the good times that Russia had on, under Tsars, like both Tsars Alexander, when it expanded, when it protected all of those people who speak Russian and who are ethnically Russian in the world, and when it stood as a great beacon of its ethnicity and of its nationhood in the world. Personally, I think this would be a terrible thing for the world, but for Putin, this would be amazing. So, first, why would this be effective in creating the, in, 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 why, why could, can the Russian government be, be effective in creating? Okay, so, so, uh, so yeah, I think, I think that that's all about uh, uh, fi finding that reason for us. To say like we, I, I think by the way, it's it's good practice to speak to your partner. Uh, just have a normal conversation about issues which are important and which may arise, because then you'll try to get to like pick each other's brains and understand how you think about these things. Uh, also, Tom and I have been debating by then quite like for for a year and a half together. So we we also we also knew some of that already, uh, and, and and I think. It, it, th this idea of 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 a, Putin wants to move to new Tsardom. He wants to bring a lot of the hallmarks of Tsarik Russia was something that was on our minds, and then uh, and 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 then from that stems those ideas. The second breakdown that you see happening, which we talked about in the workshop, is the way we break down. Uh, we were taught, by the way, but you know the great people who taught us, all our great coaches. Shout out to all of them uh, to break down message arguments, which is. Who sends the message? How did they send it? Who is it received by? How do they contextualize it? And then how do they act? That's a really useful template for message arguments because people all tend to overfocus on what do we mean to what message do we mean to send, and not enough on what message is received, contextualized, and what action uh, is created. Important thing to keep in mind for message arguments is cognitive dissonance. Every message that isn't in accordance with current perception creates dissonance. Dissonance is always resolved either through a rejection of the message or through rejection of prior beliefs. And you want to explain why dissonance will be resolved your way. Uh, so the second thing we do is that, explain why that message is actually contextualized by people who are really thirsty to hear it, who really want to hear it, and then how that actually impacts Putin's ticket for ruling specifically. So in those cases, we again contextualize that to the audience and to the panel by the fact that they know all about like the Putin riding riding a horse, uh, a bear chested, Putin, re Putin wrestling a bear stuff, and they know those things are important to Putin. So again, contextualizing it with those examples. Should we go into such intricate detail with our model? It really depends. Some models are quite obvious. Some things require a bigger model. And I, I think in this case, it's just, A, we wanted to say, the full 
like both sides of what we're doing. That actually ended up being really important in that debate because CO then has an extension on how it's better to lead with a positive message. And the fact that we in advance said that we will also have a positive message for Tariq times ended up being really important. The second thing is uh, we think it's sort of unclear and we want to explain how that's done. We want to explain how that looks. The third thing is you'll notice our first point is we want it to be effectual. So yes, we are steering into that. And I, I, I'd say if you're going big with a model, if you're saying, yeah, we're going to basically brainwash the population, then you should explain how you would do that because you're looking for that to have effectiveness in a contested environment. Uh, different, uh, sometimes uh, teams have some, some proposition which is doesn't need that deep. So there are three cases, I think. There are debates which don't need that much of a detailed model, like this house with banned zoos, this house with legalized prostitution, but also more significantly more complex motions, like uh, example, example, example. Let's find something. This house would uh, uh, round eight from Warsaw. Uh, other Latin American states should fund anti-government groups in Venezuela or something like that. So again, the, the, there isn't that much to model there. It's pretty much uh, self-explanatory. You just wanna say what you are and aren't doing. Some cases require a massive model. This is where I like to show a video by Marlena uh, for a motion uh, from Zagreb UDC of this house would partition Iraq, where she gives a beautiful six point model to because she knows that a lot of opposition's arguments are going to depend on this being done incompetently. So it's very important to make sure for this to be done in comp competently. And the third uh, question, which I think models can be important to is how big are you going? Like here we went big and that's important. I think going big is by the way, the correct answer uh, and not running away from the motion the majority of the time. But it's important to ask yourself, how big are you going? And, and, and then use your model to, uh, to highlight that. Uh, so third example, like another example of, of a, something that really requires a model is like uh, parenthood tests or voting tests. You really wanna make sure you've ironed out your, your crossed your T's and dotted your I's because a lot of opposition arguments are going to hinge on this being done not well. Like if parenthood tests are only in the majority language, then obviously opposition has a very powerful argument, but a good well-meaning government that isn't bad will make them available in all the languages that people speak. So you want to model that in because you're about to hear that and you don't want to like look like you're backtracking on your model or so don't go into too much, but you know, if, if, if it's something that takes a little bit of thought to get right, then yeah, yeah, probably you will. How to break down time management in an LO speech. Uh, so about the same as a PM speech, except you need about a minute and a half of, in, of rebel. So you have time for less positive. Uh, and last thing, uh, is there anything else I forgot? Uh, okay, so two th last things. One, uh, I leave you with uh, uh, dinosaur, and yay, and two, I'll find the Marlena video because that's like, when you when do you, when you do need a model, I think that's probably the most beautiful example I've ever seen. Um, okay, and after that, everybody uh, can get back to their business if there are no more questions. When Barack Obama says that there is no military solution in Iraq, one wonders what other kind of solution there could possibly be. At the point where IS is crucifying Christians, at the point where our neighbors like Jordan and our allies are being flooded with 500,000 Assyrian Christians, where Turkey is being flooded by refugees, and where IS takes towns every day with the Kurdish Peshmerga unable to defend themselves, we wonder what kind of solution Mr. Obama is envisaging. In opening government, we want to talk about four things in my speech. First, we want to talk about the problem insofar as like the way that ISIS has developed, why that's an issue. Second, we want to discuss how power sharing agreements will now
necessarily be ineffective in Iraq and how therefore splitting it up is the only way. They want to talk about why the United States has this responsibility and lastly why it will be successful. First, I have a five point mechanism. We will be partitioning into three states on the basis of population. We will have a uh, Kurdish state, we will have a largely Sunni state, and a largely Shia state. There's already a degree of decentralization in institutions which the United States put in place in the first place when trying to implement a power sharing pipe agreement. We will use those. Second, we will draft constitutions with explicit, like, which explicitly mandate minority rights. We are going to also have like protection in these. We are going to put massive amounts of money into building the civil infrastructure of these new states. Third, we will have a like, multilateral peace accords between the three nations, meaning that, that they are not allowed to go to war with each other. Fourth, we will have a, a mandatory disarmament. Within that, we will also say that if one state aggresses onto any of the other two states, they will have United States military backing immediately. They will be under our umbrella. Then lastly, we will have water sharing and oil sharing agreements, similar to what is in place in South Sudan with that partition. As a result of that, we already have very similar agreements in place, which puts the oil throughout Iraq. We can use similar systems. On to our substantive. The problem is ISIS. No. Is it an important clarification? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Three questions. What are you going to No, do? sit down. No, no, seriously. <laughs> no, you, you get one point. So, yeah. Uh... That that last part is also has also become famous because at the point when you just gave a five point model and then someone has three questions, they're probably badgering you too much and your deputy can answer that. Uh, so a bit sassy, but probably uh, warranted in that particular case. Uh, that's it. If there are no more questions, then uh, all the best of luck. I hope I was able to introduce some of the the joy of uh, PMing and and why it is cool and why it is a fun and neat position. And uh, all the best.